How's it going everyone? This video is part two in our series on quantum computing fundamentals. In this video, we're going to learn about quantum gates. Much like how our traditional computer utilizes logic gates to perform calculations, quantum computers use quantum gates. If you haven't watched the first video in this series on qubits, be sure to check it out. Qubits and gates are the two things used to form quantum circuits. Therefore, after this video, you will have the tools necessary to begin analyzing quantum algorithms. At the end of this video, I'm going to give an overview of Grover's algorithm, potentially one of the most useful quantum algorithms. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming content. If you have any topics in quantum computing that you would like me to cover in a video, be sure to leave a comment down below. All right, let's get into it. In the last video, we discussed how a qubit can be modeled by a vector with two numbers. These numbers are called the amplitudes. And when you take the square of the amplitudes, you get the probability of measuring a certain binary outcome. The first amplitude, a zero, the second, a one. If you measure more than one qubit, the outcome will be a larger binary number. The amplitudes for each of these outcomes can be calculated by taking the tensor product of the state vector for each qubit. In a physical system, quantum gates take the form of some kind of interaction with your qubit. For example, on superconducting qubit platforms, gates take the form of different frequency and length pulses of microwave energy. Fortunately, regardless of platform, we can use the same math to model them. In the abstract model of quantum gates, they are matrices of size 2 to the n by 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits that the gate is acting on. Applying a gate to a qubit will change its state. We can calculate the change to a qubit state by multiplying the gate matrix with the current state vector. Because of the constraint that the sum of the square of the amplitudes must be 1, any quantum gate must be modeled by what is called a unitary matrix. Unitary matrices have a couple of important properties. Firstly, they are always invertible. Furthermore, the inverse of any unitary matrix is its complex conjugate transpose. We are forced to have only invertible operations by quantum mechanics. Secondly, they always preserve length. Remember, qubit state vectors must always be of length 1, because they are squared to become probabilities. And probabilities must always sum up to 1. Let's briefly review matrix multiplication. If you have a matrix of size n by n, you can multiply it with a vector of size n. The end result is going to be another vector of length n. You can calculate this new vector by multiplying each row of the matrix with the vector. A quick example. We want to multiply this matrix with this vector. The end result of this will be another vector of the same size. To get the first entry in that vector, we take the vector and multiply it across the first row of the matrix. Then we take the sum of these values. This sum is our first entry. In order to get the second value, we do the same exact thing, except we move on to the second row of the matrix. The images you see right here are capable of describing the evolution of many types of quantum systems. This is a bit surprising. I think especially with gates, it can be hard to understand how so many different possible things, like seriously, there are 15 plus different possible qubit architectures. There's probably a lot more that we haven't even thought of. So how can they all be modeled just by vectors and matrices? Well, the fact that this model works really is quite surprising, but it does. So we can just not concern ourselves with any actual quantum mechanics and instead just focus on this linear algebra, matrix, and vector-based representation of quantum computing. A great way of thinking about quantum computing is this. We are essentially just controlling a probability distribution over some set of numbers. Using gates, we try to drive this distribution to be highly likely to measure as the answer to our problem. How we can do something like that, I will get to in a bit. Here we have the three most important gates in quantum computing. These gates are the X, H, and C0 gate. The X and H gate are single qubit operations, meaning they are matrices of size 2 by 2, which act on a single qubit state. The C0 gate is more interesting. It is a 2 qubit gate. This means that its matrix is 4 by 4, and that we multiply with the combined state vector for 2 qubits. Before we go any further with gates, I want to briefly introduce the circuit model notation. What you're looking at right here is a quantum circuit. The left represents the beginning of the circuit, and each line corresponds to a single qubit, who are all initialized to the zero state. As you travel down the wires to the right, each gate that you encounter is applied to each qubit. At the end of the circuit, it is generally implied that some mass measurement will be performed on some or all of the qubits. This symbol right here indicates measurement. So back to gates. The X gate is like the classical NOT gate. It maps the zero state to the one state, and the one state to the zero state. Just like how a NOT gate works on a classical bit. However, an X gate is more powerful because it can act on any qubit state. An X gate is represented by a matrix like this. From this matrix, we can see that an X gate will swap the amplitude of the 0 and 1 state, so it always flips the probability of measuring a 0 or 1. The next gate, the H gate, or the Hadamard gate, is a bit more interesting. The matrix representing it looks like this. 
The gate transforms the zero and one states into these two states. Notice how both of these new states will measure to zero and one with a 50% chance. These two states are very important in quantum computing. They are called the minus and the plus state. When measuring these states, the result of measurement will both be distributed the same. The only difference between the minus and the plus state is a minus sign. In quantum computing, we call this a phase difference. It won't affect the measurement, but notice what happens when we apply the Hadamard gate to these states. The plus state will return to being a zero, and the minus state will return to a one. So we have a gate that makes our state random, but then applying it again will remove that randomness from our system. This is the power of amplitudes. I want to recommend a really interesting article by Dr. Scott Aronson, a very famous quantum computing expert. It explains for the reasons behind why we have to represent quantum states with amplitudes, and why probability would be insufficient. Check it out down below. The last gate is the C naught, or the controlled dot gate. This gate is really what makes quantum computing interesting. Right here is its matrix. Notice how it is a 4x4 matrix. This means that it acts on two qubits. The classical analog to this gate would be a NOT gate that only acts on the target bit when the control bit is a 1. So it is exactly what it sounds like, a controlled NOT gate. In the notation of quantum circuits, the target qubit is denoted by this symbol and the control by a black dot. Our controlled NOT gate doesn't actually measure the qubit, so what does it mean when we say it acts when the control qubit is a 1 and doesn't act when the control qubit is a 0? What a CNOT gate actually does when it is applied to two qubits is to swap the amplitudes of the states in the qubit where the control is a 1. So if we have some state vector like this, when we apply the CNOT gate, we swap the two amplitudes where the control qubit is a 1, meaning that our vector goes from this to this. Let's look at an actual quantum circuit now. This circuit right here does something very interesting. Running two qubits through it will put our qubits into a superposition state called the Bell state. Let's understand how that happens. As always, our two qubits start out in the 0, 0 state. So our system state is 0, 0. We then apply a Hadamard to the first qubit. The Hadamard takes 0 to the plus state, so our new state is plus 0. In this case, the leftmost qubit is the first. Let's write down this vector. We calculate it by taking the tensor product of the plus and 0 state. If we do this, we will get this vector. Now let's multiply this vector with the C0 matrix. The resulting matrix will have the amplitudes where our control is 1 be swapped. If you watched the last video on qubits, you may remember this state. Notice how measuring one qubit will tell us what the other qubit is. They are entangled, and all it takes to produce this entanglement is two quantum gates. This type of entanglement, where measurement informs you about the other qubit, is called a maximally entangled state. There are actually many entangled states which are not maximally entangled. For example, a state like this is entangled because its state vector cannot be decomposed into two individual state vectors. However, you would not learn anything about one qubit from measuring the other. This kind of state sounds not very useful. However, non-maximally entangled states are super common and even play a role in Grover's algorithm, which I will be introducing soon at the end of this video. Combining the three gates that I just described, it becomes possible to create any unitary matrix operation. In a sense, you can think of these gates as being quantum Turing complete. However, there are many more gates which are commonly discussed. I want to introduce a couple more really common ones. The Z gate is a gate whose matrix is this. The effect the z-gate will have on a qubit state is to apply a so-called 180-degree phase to the qubit. What it actually does is multiply the one-state amplitude by negative one. This doesn't affect measurement, but take a look at how the circuit will act on a qubit. First, the qubit is taken from zero to plus, then from plus to minus. Lastly, the Hadamard takes our qubit back to the basis state, but instead of a zero, it is now a one. We can extend the idea of control to more gates than the c-naught. In fact, we can make any kind of controlled gate. Often they aren't implementable in the real world, but remember the X, H, and C0 gate, which generally are, and we can make any gate from the combinations of them. So what would a controlled Z gate do? Well, it multiplies the amplitude of the state where all the qubits, control and target, are 1 with a negative 1. For a controlled Z operation, we can ignore control and target distinctions because the effect is the same. What if we use more than one control? Well, this allows us to create some really interesting gates, like for example the Toffoli gate, which is a double controlled knot. It will swap the amplitudes of the states 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, or the two states where the controls are 1 and the target is being swapped. Because of the Toffoli gate, we know one thing about quantum computers. That is that they can efficiently simulate a classical computer. Or in other words, they are at least as fast as a classical computer. Look at these two circuits. If we wire the Toffoli gates up like this, we get truth tables that are equivalent to the AND and OR gate. 
Along with the X gate, this forms a Turing complete set of instructions. So we know quantum computation is at least equal to classical computation because we can officially simulate a classical computer on a quantum computer with these gates. So that is a basic introduction to quantum gates. I now want to provide a modifying example and show you how a real useful quantum algorithm works. Grover's algorithm is an algorithm for searching an unstructured database. For a database of size n, Grover's algorithm can find an item in the database and only square root of n calls. Here is a slightly more rigorous definition of Grover's algorithm. Given some function f of x, which returns a 1 for one input and a 0 for all others, we can find the x which returns a 1 in the domain of n numbers in square root of n calls to f. I'll be doing a more in-depth video on Grover's algorithm soon, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. So how on earth can a quantum computer do this? Well, here is a circuit for doing this on n equals 2 to the power of 2 search space, because we have two qubits which can represent four binary numbers. First, we start in the 0, 0 state. Then we apply a Hadamard to every qubit to make our state plus plus. Applying a Hadamard to every qubit at the beginning of an algorithm is an extremely common thing in quantum computing. The next thing we do is pass our qubits through an oracle, which swaps the phase of the amplitude of the state we are looking for. For a simple example, we can just use a controlled Z gate, which will swap the phase of the 1, 1 state. Then we pass our qubit through this circuit. Understanding why this circuit does what it does is a bit beyond this video. But in short, this step of Grover's will increase the amplitude of negative states and suppress the amplitude of positive states. The final effect of this portion of the circuit will be that we will lose the phase on the target state. In the two qubit case, we are now done. The probability that we will measure a 1, 1 when we measure our qubits is 100%. In a larger example, we repeat the oracle and amplification stage square root of n times to maximize the probability of measuring the target state. The amplification can never get us exactly to 100% chance except in the case of two qubits. So we always have some small chance of measuring the wrong number. This is the case even in an ideal quantum computer with no noise, which we are quite far from. And with that, I wanna wrap this video up. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to quantum gates. If you have any questions or recommendations, please leave a comment down below. And as always, make sure to like and subscribe. See you in the next video.